thank you so much, and uh, thank you, Arma, for the warm welcome. Thank you for the invitation, Dr. Bhave. And uh, let me just add a few words about my background, because that will give you the context for my comments. So I come from engineering. I did my PhD in engineering also, and then I spent 25 years of my life in a business school. So the interdisciplinary aspect you're talking about is something that I really think is very important. And to some degree, I've lived that in my own personal career. I, of course, grew up in India, and then I studied in the US, my doc, graduate studies. And then I worked in Europe for 23 years. And now I have moved back to the States for some time. So that, again, is a useful context, because what I have seen over the years are different experiences across the world, so in Asia, Europe, and America. So in that sense, I bring together, at least in my own comments and experience, some kind of more holistic global ex experience out here. But let me just give you a few thoughts on the kind of challenges that education institutions like yours like the school that I am the dean of, we face today. Because I've thought a lot about these issues over the last few years, both when I was in Europe and also now when I'm in the US as the dean of the Johnson School. And when I think about this conceptually, I like to articulate it as the five R's. So what are the five challenges, the five issues that we are facing? And of course, when I talk about the five R's, I will reflect perhaps some more of a slightly Western bias, given my own experience in those markets. But I'm sure you will find elements of that which reflect and which are important also for your own institute, because you are also a global institution. So as was described, you don't, in some sense, even though the home is in India, every organization today is a global organization in many different ways. So what are the five R's? The first one is research. And I do think that research lies at the heart of excellence. Doesn't matter what the institution does, research lies at the heart. And I say this because I think that is also a weakness for many Indian institutions. Like Aroma, I come from IITs, and I'm sure many of you probably have spent some time in IITs. They're wonderful institutions. But really, despite having world-class students, as part of the student community, they're nowhere at the level of MIT, Stanford, Caltech, and other similar top world-class technical institutions. And the reason is not because of lack of quality of students. The reason is because lack of enough focus on fundamental research. Now, research is very important, and that forms a bedrock of any claim to excellence, really. But you look at institutions worldwide, if you don't have a good research capability, nothing else works. You can survive in the short run, but nothing else actually works. Now, in the research domain, what is the most important element? The most important element, from my own experience, has been asking the right questions. Because in life, as we all probably realize, the secret of leadership, the secret of success, is not necessarily having the right answers, because often there are no right answers, but being able to ask the right questions, and then having an engaged discussion debate around what are some possible ways to answer that question. And often there are no, there's no one correct way to do things or to answer a question. So the ability to be able to ask the right question, I think, lies at the heart of good research excellence. Of course, you need good, well-trained professors. You need adequate support for doing the research. But if you don't ask the right questions, you get into the kind of criticism or syndrome that many of the top research institutions today suffer from. And they often are criticized, many schools, especially in the business world, for doing research in esoteric topics that don't necessarily have relevance to real-world problems. So to be able to ask the right questions lies, I think, at the heart of the core challenge. And this is often a difficult issue, especially when you're leading an institution, because faculty members are very individualistic. You know? And the training that we get in the PhD program is not really collective. 
We're not trained to do collective research. A PhD is what you do individually. So as a result of the training, the entire ethos and the entire culture in research is primarily individualistic. Of course, you collaborate, but really the core thing is you work in your own silo by yourself on the questions of interest to you. And those things, how do you moderate your own interests, your own questions, with the broader questions and issues that the institution might wish to focus on, that might be relevant society as a whole, is an interesting challenge. So today, as a dean of Johnson, you know, Cornell is a top academic institution, I must say that I feel challenged in directing my faculty body's research. So I cannot go and tell them, do research on this issue. Because they will say, guess what, I believe this is very important. So balancing that issue in terms of how do you balance that academic freedom, which is also important, coupled with the need for the institution to have an impact on some key themes is not easy. So that's, in a sense, some of the core issues around research. The second R is linked to what I said earlier, is relevance. So research is great, but if it is not relevant to real world problems, real world issues, fundamentally, the ultimate utility of that can be questioned. And if you just think mentally of a very simple matrix, two by two matrix, on one hand, you put rigor, scholarly rigor of the research. On the other axis, you put the real world relevance. So relevance, rigor as the two dimensions. And today, what you would see is most of the top institutions, especially in the business world, a little bit less so in engineering, other fields are more applied, in the business school world that I come from, and probably also closer to some other fields which are more emerging, the focus has been on high rigor and perhaps low relevance. That is the positioning associated with almost most top institutions. In general, there's a whole range of other institutions that have emerged that are positioning themselves in the high relevance but low rigor. But they don't necessarily get the same respect for the research insights. Now the challenge for institutions is to be able to combine the two. Rigorous research combined with relevant practice. I know, for example, in your own institution, as I mentioned, you're trying to combine the two. But guess what? It is very hard to do so. It is a nice concept in practice, in theory, but in practice to actually put an implementation is a challenge. And that's another challenge which you know, I face, other business school deans, other deans and institutions face, is how do you balance these two elements? Because what happens is the pressure on revenues pushes the institution towards practice. If you have too high of a practice component, the researchers on the rigor side complain. You're losing the rigor and the academic integrity of the institution. And there is a power struggle. And usually in most top institutions, the academic researchers usually win. And they are not necessarily equally sensitive to the pressures on the practice side. So a key challenge really on the relevance discussion is everyone talks about it, that research, rigor, and real world relevance should be combined. But combining the two is easier said than done. It's a very important challenge for an institutional culture. What's the third issue that I see for us in academic world is really around richness. When I talk about richness, what I mean is, what is the ability of institutions to integrate diverse viewpoints? And that goes back to the interdisciplinary aspect of the nature of the challenge that your institution is leading, that Aruma referred to in his introductory comments. Now what happens is, given the kind of a research training we mostly receive in the PhD program, given the nature of our institutions that tend to be more silo-based, the level of collaboration that happens across disciplines is actually quite low. 
And a very good indicator of that is the number of top academic journals that exist for interdisciplinary research is very, very low. Most of the top academic journals are true to one discipline. And that's the training. Okay, so if you want to have an impact on the field, your incentive is to stick to one discipline area and try and publish in the best journals in that area. If you want to publish in multidisciplinary fields or interdisciplinary fields, it's not clear which journal to choose. And often the incentives for publishing in many of the new emerging journals are low because they're not necessarily seen at the right quality level. So you have this challenge that fundamentally the academic world is quite siloed right from the moment where we start producing PhDs. And this carries on into institutions. So bringing this richness of viewpoints is a challenge. It's not easy. And despite you know people saying, yes, we do it and we value it and everything else, the entire structure and the system, the incentives out there, don't necessarily make it easy for either individuals or institutions to bring that richness of perspective. At the same time, for trying to address some of the real world problems we're facing today, that richness is critical. Let's take, for example, environment or housing, you know, or urbanization or you know, inequality or health or any one of these bigger issues. The big issue society faces, no one discipline can solve it alone. You need to bring in multiple disciplines. Now, right now at Cornell, we are involved in a very ambitious project. So Mayor Bloomberg, after the 2008-09 financial crisis in New York, he realized that the economy of New York City was too focused on finance and media. So he said, we have to diversify the economy of New York City. So he had a big competition, American style, you know, said, let's invite a major technology university into the city. Stanford, Cornell were the two finalists. Cornell won, it's great news for me, but you know, in a sense what is happening right now is Cornell is engaged in a partnership with the city government and local private sector to create a new 21st century innovation ecosystem in New York City. Now how is that happening? It's happening to partnership, of course with the university and private sector, government, city officials and so on, but also inside the university through a partnership between like, cross engineering, computer science, and business. Because engineering alone cannot create the jobs. Business alone create, cannot create the company. You need the two to come together. And I can tell you that it is not easy. Okay, we're trying to do it. But it is not easy to get different schools in a large university to collaborate in a deep manner. So this kind of a richness of perspective is not easy to achieve and it's something that needs to be designed into the system to some degree. So in Cornell Tech, the New York City campus we're trying to build right now, there are very important structural decisions being made to help that to happen. For example, just one of them is faculty don't have offices. Now that's a fairly radical thing for faculty in a top institution where you're used to having security of your office. Okay, you can close the door and you can shut the world out and do the research. Now, there they have cubicles, very tech-oriented cubicles. And the whole idea out there is to make it easier for people to cross boundaries and work across each other. So there is an important challenge out there in introducing the richness element in terms of what we do in, in universities. The fourth R is reach. Now, I think this was already mentioned in your comments, Aruma, and I think I'm happy you mentioned that is the balance out there across scale and quality. Now, if you look at most institutions today, the top ones, elite ones, they tend to be high quality and low scale. The question of scale varies, but usually if you look at, for example, computer science class in IIT, even today, one IIT takes 50, 60 students, nothing much more than that. Take a university like MIT, they take X number of hundreds of students every year. If you compare the demand that is there for education in countries like India, Latin America, and you know, Africa, and other parts of the world, these institutions are just simply unable to satisfy the demand. That's very clear. 
Okay, even if you take a few hundred, it's not enough for the requirement to need out there. At the same time, on the other end of the spectrum, so if you think of a simple two by two, once again, of scale and quality, you have some open universities. Okay, in London National Open University, one example of it is Open University in the UK, that's another example of it, that are seen for large scale, but not necessarily high quality. Okay, so if people do all kinds of correspondence courses, you can have big scale, but not high quality. And the combination, how do you bring it together? Do scale, but at high quality. That's a big challenge. And the challenge is there because the academic model that we have in universities today hasn't really changed. So we have the still classroom-based amphitheater style kind of instruction model, which goes back 3,000 years to the Greek amphitheaters. And that basic model hasn't changed. So what is happening is that the fundamental face-to-face -face interaction, classroom-based, you know, 50, 60, 100 people in a classroom, that model is still so prevalent that it is somehow impossible to break the constraints of that to combine both scale and quality. Of course, the hope out there is technology. So people are looking at technology as one way to break the barriers and perhaps do things in that area. You probably have heard of the, the current trend in what is called MOOCs, you know, massive open online courses. You know, professors are teaching 200,000, 150,000 students. They are still seen as scale but low quality right now. So it remains to be seen whether or not we can come up with some kind of hybrid models that combine scale and quality. So I think this is a very important issue in terms of how do you increase reach, because today even society is asking for that. In India is well known, you know, 60% of the population below 25, whatever, you know, some high figure like that. The same figures are true, by the way, for Africa, for Middle East, many other parts of the world. A lot of the emerging markets in the world are young populations. And how do you satisfy the, you know, the ambition, the aspiration for young people around the world for good quality education? So that's a massive issue, a big question that you know, we are struggling with. And there are deep fundamental business model constraints that prevent us from doing anything radical. And that's one reason why you haven't seen any institution today, I would argue, worldwide, that has successfully combined scale and quality. None, at the best of my knowledge. The last R is a very important one, is resources. And clearly we need resources financing for what we do. For the operations, for giving scholarship to students, for attracting talent. And the resource part is extremely important. And I do believe that you know, resourcing poses some interesting ethical questions for institutions, poses some interesting questions in terms of policies. I can tell you, for example, in America right now, there's a huge debate that is ongoing society about how the price of education is increasing far more than what the wages have increased, or even what the CPI index is increasing. So there has been an inflation and the educational cost. And people are saying, well, this is just simply not sustainable because people can't afford to enter into education any longer. The different core points of view on this, you know, so when rich universities like Harvard and Yale, they come and ask for money, on one hand you can make the argument and say, you know, why do you need the money if you already have the huge endowments? But then they would make the argument, well, we need the money to be able to attract the best faculty, to be able to, best, to build the best infrastructure, to be able to attract the best students. And it is the reality. Talent is expensive. Talent is globally mobile. So one reason why American universities excel, because even today on a global basis, European universities don't have the same level of research excellence and global excellence, barring a few. Oxford, Cambridge, Imperial, ETH, a few examples. But by and large, Europe has more very good as opposed to excellent. So what America has is you know, a reasonable set of excellent universities. And the reason they're excellent is because they're able to fight the battle for talent effectively. One reason why universities in India haven't progressed as much is because Indian universities are not able to fight for global talent both in terms of faculty and in terms of students. 
So resourcing is very important to be able to succeed in this battle for talent because ultimately talent is what makes university succeed, an excellent one. But at the same time, where do you get the money from? Okay. And that is a big issue because traditionally, of course, you tend to go to your alumni for resourcing. If you're a young institution, you don't have an alumni base, what do you do? You can go to corporations for funding. Increasingly, companies are hesitant, reluctant to give funding because a lot of corporate governance rules and a lot of regulations are coming in. They have to justify why they have to fund universities, other kinds of institutions. And if you are actually start funding yourself through consulting or practice-oriented kind of practices, you start running the risk of pulling the center of gravity institution away from research towards more practice. So there's no easy answer out here. And that's a challenge that I think the heads of all institutions face in terms of how do you build that effective resource base that is sustainable, that is also oriented towards a way in which it helps support the long-term directions of the institution. So those are, you know, I just, I think I wanted to present to you a conceptual way, the way I look at some of the key challenges that we face. So once again, they are on research, uh, being able to ask the right questions. It's around richness. How do you actually integrate the multiple perspective? It's around relevance. How do you actually balance the academic rigor with the real world focus? It's around reach. You know, how do you combine quality and scale? It's about resourcing. You know, how do you actually win in this warp of global talent? Okay, so let me stop out there.